we had this big caravan ride to South Carolina State. And, oh, it was big. And, and the policemen in all the little towns would stop traffic for us to pass through. It was a huge caravan. And you couldn't see the beginning. I don't know who called the handball offense nickname, but if you go to Snookies and ask Bruce Young who called it, I'm sure he knows. But it was simply a spread offense, and you know, as quarterback, you got to be able to make split-second decisions. Oh, I got a lot of attention, but we had a lot of awful good football players on our team. Money Shaw, we had Gerald Harris, Ricky Harris, Frankie Johnson, Tony Bessler, and Coach Paul Johnson. Even today, Paul is one of the greatest offensive coaches in football. And I'm telling you, man, I mean, definitely, man, we were like maybe only 4 or 5% blacks at the college at the time. And I come back now, and I go, wow, it's amazing. And we basically all came here together. And we grew up together. And we really enjoyed playing together. Then you had Earth, who was obviously stringing it together, which made us a pretty good team. You know, when you have a team, you really have a fraternity. So you develop a, a brotherhood with those guys you played with. Black, white, it didn't make a difference. At the end of the day, you all going through the same thing. It's 110 degrees out, you're sweating, you're tired. Man, you can't even see color. All you want to do is make sure you get your work in so you get some opportunity to win. You know, when I think back on all the interviews I've done, I never had to answer the question about how's the race relation. I'm not oblivious. It's in our society. Is it in the South? Yes. But did we deal with it here in Georgia Southern at that time? No. I mean, it wasn't an issue. I never heard why are we playing a black quarterback instead of a white quarterback? Because I think Earth did a good job of protecting this team. And if it went on, we never heard it as players. You know, your coach becomes like your father in college. They essentially give you a lot of guidelines, not only to play football by, but also how to act out the field and in the classroom. Do right, he say. Do right. At the end of the game, we are pumped up and happy. And he goes, y'all have a good time tonight. But do right. States for a Bullock County rallied around our football team and, and helped build it. Good evening, I'm Tyson Davis. Tonight I'm speaking on behalf of Tim Durk. I remember, I remember the huge excavators out there digging the bowl to make the prettiest little stadium in America, and you know all the people who supported our, you know all the people who supported our team, they they go out borrowing money to travel to the to the next game, and it, they had the the eagle wing periods or the home away from home periods where a state for a family would uh, adopt one or two athletes and have them over for Sunday dinner or maybe just go over and do laundry or maybe hang out with their kids or swim in their pool or fish in their pond and, and just make you feel like you're at home. And now I get to build their houses. I, I get to renovate their homes or maybe I do business with them or buy insurance or bank with them and so forth. And it was just unbelievably touching how much respect they had for us as young men and as players. And coaches are lifelong teachers and the blood and the sweat and the tears on the football field, the, the camaraderie of teamwork, that's what Coach Russell's about. Big team, little man. Put your team first. Yeah, yeah, he, he went to Johnson's Bennett Mark, which was a famous place to buy your beverages after a victory. And I saw Coach Russell in there, and, and uh, I was thinking about buy, buying some beverages. And you're thinking about giving us something 
I'm thinking about the things that go along with being a college student. Yeah, I, I was walking in one door, and he was walking out the other door, and he goes, well, hey, Tim, how are you? And I mean, what do you say? And, and he just says, I just hope you have a wonderful, wonderful evening. And he says, isn't it awesome to be an eagle after a wonderful victory on Saturday in Statesboro? And he says, just remember one thing, do right. And, you know, I mean, a lot of people would have, you know, taken disciplinary action against you, but he knew we'd worked hard and, and deserved an opportunity. And all you can hear is do, do right. And you can see him nine, 9 o'clock in the morning. He comes jogging by. It'll be 114 degrees, and he comes jogging by. He says something like, it's a great day to be an eagle. Everyone go, ah, it's out of here. And he's saying it's great. And so we're, we're watching this old man run by. So we like, oh, man, come on. We can't let that happen, right? So we will either jog with them or start our own little run. And that rattlesnake thing was the most amazing. Lynn Byers had just died. And Don Rogers, he was a defensive back for Cleveland. They both died of a drug overdose. We saw it on the news. You know, sometimes you think you're so far removed and it can't happen to you. But Coach thought it was important enough to come up with a well thought out demonstration. You know, I mean, when he threw that snake out there, you know, a brother scared a snake. So, when you hear that, that rattle, there's no mistake in that. And for him to take the time to make that analogy with drugs, at that time when we were in our college career, it, it had a lot of impact. So his handprint is all over me as an individual and certainly as a football player because it gave us the ability to feel like nothing is impossible. Look, never say die. As long as you put your work in, you got a chance. As long as there's time on the clock, you got a chance. I remember particularly one game, Troy State. Troy State had a good football team. And he gave his general speeches. And on occasion, he pulled me to the side and said, Tracy, we need this one. And that what made him so special, being able to talk straight to guys. Being able to get the most out of guys. During once during practice, he told one guy, he said, Look, uh, I don't think you're good enough to play one double A football. Man, that guy went out there and tore up everything. He just um he just challenged the guy. He said, Look, uh, I don't think you're good enough. Go prove it. You know, did I ever mention he was clever? <laughs> he was always looking for ways to motivate people. I mean, just simple things. Hey, he came in here one day, and it was raining. And he asked me if I had a milk jug. And I said, yeah, I got a milk jug. What do you want? And he said, I'm going to get a little bit of that Eagle Creek water. And they were flying somewhere to a playoff game. And he said, I'm going to take a little bit of that Eagle Creek water with me. And I said, well, coach, it's raining out there. Let me get it for you. And he said, no, you'll just go back there and get it out of the sink. And I don't want sink water. I want the real stuff. So I go back there and get him a milk jug. And then he asked me if I had a clothes hanger. So I get him a clothes hanger. And I watch him. He walks across that field in the rain, hangs off that bridge, and gets that eagle. And then he takes it with him on that trip 
and he spreads it all over the field. You've heard that story before. Oh, mystical in the creek water. I tell you what now, it was, come on, man. It was the dirtiest water in Statesboro. But we went on the road to places, and nobody was there with us. And he get one of his speeches as he poured the water, and you can see the guys going crazy. It's the day before the game, right? The guys are already running on in. Okay, all right. The community in Statesboro is with us. Man, those guys, whoever come up with the idea to have football here, other than Dale Lee, alone list them, gave money, and really supported us, really believed in what was going on. That's what they know here in Statesboro. They know a winner. And, and we won. And so winning makes you blind to a lot of things, right? We all understand winning, right? It don't hurt as bad after the game when you win it. You know, the girls look pretty. And even the guys, we look a lot better when we win. And so winning cures a lot of heartache, man. And winning right here. Certainly, Capricorn, the program, and tiered it to a different stratosphere. It's December 21st, 1985, and we're hoping for a miracle. The game seesawed back and forth until Furman took the big lead. But Georgia Southern came back and tied it in 28-28, and then went ahead of touchdown 35-28. Furman came back and tied the game by score 35 to 35. Then Georgia Southern hit a field goal and it was 38 to 35. But Furman just went quick. They scored again to leave 42 38. And time was running out. Time was running out. There wasn't much time left. A minute 32 seconds left for history. Man, we really need to win this one. Just one more time. Just one more time. One more time. One more time. One more time. Nobody open. Then Tony Bessel was out there 14 yards away. We got the first down. Then three plays later, it was what Earth called third and forever. Somebody in the huddle said, Then the play came in. It was called 378 million. One more time! One more time! One more time!
especially proud of Raymond Gross. He played so well. I'm not singling him out as as being the only player. We had people that played their hearts out out there for us today. Where's your mom? She's down there somewhere. That's all right. Last year after the Furman game, she and I cried together and said, hopefully, that we might have another chance, and we did, and he did good. Don't let her get away, because I'm going to hug her again. <laughs> so forth. 
much of that took place at Snooky's after we were both retired. And after he retired, I, I asked Coach Russell to be the, the motivational speaker for our Home Builders Association. And I asked him, I said, well, I told him, I said, Coach, uh, we're having a membership drive, and, and I want to double our members. And he said, well, you know, what, what would you like for us to do, Tim? And I said, well, I'd like for you to talk to our association the way you talk to us. And he said, what did I say? And I said, well, Coach, I don't know exactly what it is you said, but I, you just had a way of saying it. And he said, well, let me think about it. He gave an awesome motivational speech. We got like 90 new members, and then after it, when I was thanking him, I told the crowd, I said, all right, y'all want to witness this. And I said, Coach, I have always wanted to get a six-pack of tall boys and get you in a little bitty boat out in the middle of a big, huge lake and say, all right, you've got to tell me right now what it is that you have that makes you do what you do and makes other people do what they do. You're a life-changing person. Well, we're not out in the middle of a big, huge lake, but here's your six-pack of tall boys, and I want you to tell us just one more time what it is that you have. And you know, you could tell that it, it really had an effect on him being told how special he was in a completely different setting. I talked with Jay Russell, coach's son, and, and Miss Jean Russell, coach's wife, uh, after they gave us permission to put the, the bus of Co Coach Russell in the end zone at Paulson Stadium, and you know, they said that they didn't want anything big and gaudy. But the bus is, uh, well, you can touch it. And it, it lets players know as they're running on the field that, that it's game time, and, and that is life-changing as well. You know, there's probably a hundred things that I could say, but, but I just want everybody in Statesboro, at Bullock County, and Georgia Southern to know that, that I am I'm quite, quite thankful for the opportunities that, that you've given me and my family and and the support that you show us every day, and I, I just feel welcome. In 1986, and for four or five years, I was the beginning cross-country coach. And that was around the same time as the start of the football program. Uh, you know, I had this, this locker in, in the basement of Hanner. Herb had a locker. We all had to share this, this lead-type shower. You know, the water just kind of flows down on. There's no shower head or anything. It's very primitive. We were all in this together. Herc never asked for anything that his, his lowest coach or, or trainer didn't have. If it was good enough for them, it was good enough for him. He never asked for a, a lavish office or lavish headquarters. You know. When we went on that first road game, all we had were those solid blue helmets, the, the cheapest we could get. And Irk passed around the ankle tape and said, today we are first class. Put a stripe on your helmet. And that goes more towards be, building team spirit than those guys could overcome huge obstacles if they believed in themselves. And he believed in them.
bring it closer to the city. But there were farming needs. And people thought Statesboro had given up its opportunity for growth. But the football program was like a seed that has been planted in this town and it has produced a, a great harvest because we have businesses and retail and industry that has been able to succeed far beyond what was ever imagined. So I think there's a great big root that is spreading in this town because of the program and it is emanating into a great big oak tree that will be firmly established for a long time to come. I was in Atlanta in uh, 1989, 1988, when the story broke that UGA was aggressively recruiting her to what at some point must have been his dream job. It was not a slow news week. Yasser Arafat had decided to recognize Israel as a legitimate state. And there was an earthquake in Iran that killed 25,000 people. Despite all this, the banner headline across the Constitution's front page was, Irk may leave. Irk's possible departure from Georgia Southern was the dominating news story as far as the New York Times of the South was concerned. So, Irk did put Georgia Southern on the map. He set an example of how to be decent to people, how to treat people well, and how to motivate people. He had a positive impact on everyone he met. He was, in terms of those teens, he was just unbelievable. I ran into, well, I, I'll tell you that one off the record, I think. Well, in 1988, when I was offered the job here at Southern, Herc called me on the phone and he said, Herc, this is Herc. <laughs> He said, you're going to love it here, and you need to take this job. Now, I would have taken the job anyway, but that was just icing on the cake. And you know, Mary Lou and I love Statesboro. We love Georgia Southern. But to be so closely associated with her, well, that's one of the highlights of my life. Now, when I came here, I told her that I wasn't going to take off my national championship ring from Georgia until he went, won another national championship for Georgia Southern. And I, I did. But in 1989, when he won that national championship, I took off that ring from Georgia, and I got my Georgia Southern championship ring. I gave the other one to my son. Now, I'm a coin collector, and one day, Eric wanted me to go to his safety deposit box to show me some of his coins. And when he opened it up, there was a Ziploc bag with six or seven of his national championship rings, watches in there. I mean, he never wore them. He was a humble man like that. Now, the first football game that I went to was in Pocatello, Idaho. I didn't know where Idaho was, much less Pocatello. And we should have won a national championship against Furman that year, but one of our best players fumbled the ball on the 10-yard line. Oh, it was so depressing. And during that time, it was even more depressing because the University of Georgia had called her and had offered him the head coach position up at Georgia. And, and, and when we got back to Statesboro, there was a whole crowd of people waiting. And some of them had signs, and they said, don't go, Irk. Don't go. But fortunately, he turned them down. He only stayed at Southern for one more year. But in that year, he went 15 and 0. And that was the highlight of Irk's career, to go undefeated during that last year. Oh, the only team in the entire 20th century to go 15 and 0.
And so, not only did he take us, he took this community. He took South Georgia. Our sense of pride is in South Georgia is at the top of the flagpole because of Erskine Russell. And that's hard to prove, but it's there. Just take my word for it. It's there. Yes, it's a, it's a story that Earth didn't avoid, but it's a story that he felt was for the family alone. Uh, you know, a loss is a terrible thing for a family. So this is the story of uh, Earth and Jean's little child. It was Rusty, the oldest, Jay, the baby, and Don, the middle child. And years later, people wanted to talk to Eric about this, and Eric said, no, we're just not going to talk about that now. And he didn't say it with any animosity. It was just, it was just kind of a shutdown thing. And I, I, the only reason I knew about it was that my good friend, uh, Louis Rizard, the famous columnist, he had told me, he said, if you ever get a chance to get her to talk about uh, Don, you need to do that. So we're in the cellar of the Hannah Field House, and we're doing family in the book that we're writing together. And, um, you know, I, I know about Don, but I'd never mentioned it, never mentioned it. And Earth is sitting there, he's, he's facing the wall, uh, not looking at me, and he's rocking back in two, and I'm sitting to his left. And I said, Earth, you know, we've got to put Don in the book, because after all, that was such an important part of your, of your life. So Earth says, okay, all right, man, these, did you get it right the first time, because I'm not going to say it again. So it happened when they were, when Eric and Jean were very young. And it was an afternoon, and um, Eric was off fishing at the pond with Rusty, who was, uh, I think, nine at the time. Don was three. Jay was just a baby in the baby carriage. Jean was in the yard with the children playing, and, and she had gone around and pushed Jay around into the 